coming down the, the cold there. Be nice and comfortable and warm here. If you're able, please sing it. Join me tonight as we sing hymn 26, Come Thou Found. Hymn 26.
want to thank those that helped with the decorating this week and remind everybody about the wedding this Saturday. that will be at 11 a.m. And uh, so hope that you'll join us for that special occasion. We're excited for the Atwells to be. Okay. Uh, exciting times. All right. So that'll be Saturday morning at 11 a.m. And then next Monday, December the 5th, will be a Women of Wisdom meeting at the Roaches. That'll be at 1 o'clock, yes, at 1 p.m. And then Tuesday evening is the Ladies' Christmas Gathering. That's back in the Fellowship Hall. All the ladies in the church, of course, are invited. And you're, you're welcome to bring a guest with you, but you do need to get signed up for that. And so make sure that you've done that. The sign-up sheet's still on the bulletin board for now, and I would guess Sunday, obviously Sunday's the deadline, so that makes sense. All right, and then there's some other events there on the right-hand side of your bulletin. I hope you take note of and make sure you prioritize those things. If you'd like to support our young people and our school, our first basketball game is this Friday, just a couple days away. Of course, we uh, host those at First Baptist in Miamisburg. Our uh, junior high boys and varsity girls will be playing. The first game's at 5 o'clock, so hope that you'll join us if you're able to. All right, we'll have our ushers come and receive our offer tonight. Of course, uh, unless otherwise designated, the off Wednesday night offerings go to Bethel Baptist School. And let me again commend you and thank you for your generosity, especially over the last few weeks for our teachers' uh, Christmas offering and bonus. And appreciate your your uh, giving to that. All right. Let's see. Cole, you want to play more, sir? Yes, sir. Dear Lord, I'm thankful for this opportunity to come to the church and worship you. I pray. Let's go to D Daniel chapter 4 in your Bible this evening. Just reviewing my notes, I, I think that uh, our time in Daniel are the Alpha and Omega Wednesday nights of November. We haven't been here in several weeks due to special events and, and activities, uh, but look forward to what God has for us here from this last section of Daniel chapter 4. Let me review a little bit before we read our, our text this evening, but if you'll find Daniel chapter 4 there. Uh, we noted, we have noted that this is a very unusual chapter in, in the Bible. Uh, we have record of yet another unusual dream, a, a dream that the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to have uh, to re and used Daniel to reveal to him uh, some, some truth. Uh, of course, this also is a chapter that talks about a very unusual season in Nebuchadnezzar's life, which we'll look at. Uh, tonight, the chapter begins with what I believe is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. Let's just look there uh, for review's sake. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God wrought toward me. So I look at this chapter this way, as, as Nebuchadnezzar this, and most believe this was a royal uh, edict or a royal uh, statement that was released. In our day, it would have been, uh, you know, press release, and it would have been distributed. And Nebuchadnezzar saying, "Look, I've come to faith in in the Almighty God, and now I'm going to tell you how how that transpired in my life, how that happened in my life." And so 
the beginning of this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar's declaring peace, peace to everyone. Well, as we read through the chapter, we're going to see tonight, uh, it took him a long time to, to arrive at this place. His road to faith, his road to trusting the Lord was a long road by his choice. Our road to faith does not need to be a long road. It should be immediate. It should be immediate. So let's stand together. We're going to, we're going to jump down now, if you would, with me to verse 28. Daniel has revealed to Nebuchadnezzar the dream about this uh, tree stump and that what was going to happen if Nebuchadnezzar didn't, didn't uh, obey the Lord. And I tell you what, let's go back to verse 27. That'll help us with verse 28. Let's look at verse 27. Daniel speaking, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So we see here the opportunity for Nebuchadnezzar to partake of the mercy and grace of God. Show your faith by what... By, by your action, O king. Verse 28. All this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, so 12 months after Daniel interprets a dream, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Can you imagine seven years of not trimming your nails? <laughs> At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose Dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Uh, let me make this comment here. This verse is not teaching us that we shouldn't ask God questions. The deal is we shouldn't accuse God. None can say unto him, what doest thou? And that would be, and I mean no, no disrespect by this, we'd be like, Lord, what are you doing? No one would really approach the Lord that way. You shouldn't, right? But it's not, many times we say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on here. The, the spirit, the attitude, the heart of the, uh, the question, the inquisitor matters. And what Nebuchadnezzar is saying, no one can accuse God. You know, you, you've done something wrong. God, God makes no mistakes. Next verse, 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. I've titled our message tonight, Time Does Tell. Father, help us again as we look into your word. Help us to see truth that we need to apply personally to our own lives. And Lord, help us also to see truth that you would want to use us to help others in this life to be prepared to meet you in eternity. For we know that all of us will. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether saved or lost, all will stand before you someday. And Lord, help us to, to recognize 
of the need to praise you in this life, to trust you in this life, and lead others to do likewise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Nebuchadnezzar's pride is well documented. He was proudly resisting God. Most, most of mankind does. Unfortunately, many people who claim the Lord as their Savior resist the work of God in our lives. But he was walking in his palace on this particular day, as recorded in our text, and he had been warned. He'd had this dream. It troubled him. He brought the wise men in again. They couldn't give the answer or the, the interpretation of the dream, but Daniel was able to interpret it. King, this is what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to be, you're going to go insane for, for seven years. Uh, and then at the end of that interpretation, again, Daniel says, look, you can get right with God. It may be that God will lengthen thy tranquility if you'll get, get right with God. Daniel understood that God is a God of mercy and grace. Yet he also understood that God is a God of justice. You know, one of our problems in this generation, in our, our dispensation of time on this earth, is our, the hyper-grace movement has infiltrated our reasoning to, to where we assume that that we have forever, and we can just live as we please, and everything's going to be just fine. Uh, Daniel understood that although God is a God of mercy and grace, he's also a God of righteousness, holiness, and justice. And he is, friend. God is righteous and holy, and we need to recognize that. But Nebuchadnezzar is, is wandering uh, around on his palace. Most believe, of course, the, 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 the buildings in that time, would have, in that area, would have been flat-roofed, and so a lot of people would would spend the evening walking around on, on their roof and enjoying things. And to get a little bit of a glimpse here of, of the, the, the wonder of what Nebuchadnezzar had, had built and established, uh, a few facts about, about uh, Nebuchadnezzar's palace in Babylon at, at that time. The outside walls of the city of Babylon are said to have been 335 feet high. Now, if you're giving 10 feet per story, that's 33 and a half stories tall. Now, we might not think that as being very high in our day, in our time of skyscrapers, but you can imagine in this time, 600 years before Christ, some city with a wall that wide, that tall, and, and 80, 80 plus feet wide uh, would have been an amazing accomplishment to construct such a, a, a city with those walls. It was massive. It was also masterfully designed. It was a square city. All of the four walls, uh, they, were, they were square, all of the four walls had 25 solid brass gates that uh, opposed each other. So all four walls, so you can understand there were streets from gate to gate within the city. So while the Euphrates River went through the center of the city, if you will, and they had constructed beautiful bridges to cross the Euphrates. Again, amazing engineering feat in that time. You know, 600 years before Christ. It's a long time ago. Uh, the the uh, streets were perfectly uh, designed where you could enter a gate on this side of the city, cross through, cross that, that street, and exit a gate on the other side of the city. And they intersected so that, that the, the, the blocks were square. You ever get frustrated trying to find streets in which direction you're going? And some of these around here that follow the rivers? Around, right? There, a lot of them aren't square, right? You, you, it's nice to get to a place where, okay, yeah, if it's, uh, if it's a numbered street that's going east-west, or, or and if it's a lettered street, then it's going north-south, or vice versa, whatever the case is, a little easier to be able to figure things out in some, some of those cities. And in some, of, some places like ours where everything's named after somebody or after trees or whatever, you go, where am I? I don't know what part of the city, you know, you're in a strange town, you can't figure out what direction you're going, and and uh, the twists and turns can be a little bit challenging. But in, in uh, Babylon at this time, it was uh, very uh, uh, dis distinct. They constructed these beautiful uh, bridges. And this river uh, that split, the, split the, the king's palace and the temple uh, to their false gods, we would understand to be Baal. Baal, they had a, a tremendously large uh, image of Baal within, within their their temple. It was on one side of the river. There was a bridge that crossed the river, and then there was the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. We are 
un, we understand that his palace was so massive that people looked at it and the, and the gardens of his palace appeared to be a mountain that had been constructed. He built like terrace levels uh, up and we, from what we understand that was because his, his, uh, his prized queen of, uh, uh, of his many women from what we understand he adored her and, and she wanted something to remind her of her hometown, her home uh, village and, and upbringing and so he constructed this massive uh, garden place and again it's rising up out of the desert. So for Nebuchadnezzar to be walking around the top of his palace at this great high place he's looking out over the expanse of of uh, the, the region, the expanse of, you can see the entire city, no doubt. He looks across the river to, to this temple that he's constructed, and, and uh, he's, he's full of pride. We can understand why he would be. Yet at the same time, we're well aware of the fact that God has tried time and time and time again to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. Daniel has been a witness for the Lord in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, in his palace. And yet again, Nebuchadnezzar rejects the Lord. My first point is judgment now. This choice is yours. This choice is mine. What do we mean? What do I mean? Each of us have the choice to agree with the just judgment of God or to resist his word in our own selfish pride. You know, most of our world is resisting God. Most of our world is, we would say, we look at the, the decisions of our society and the, the things that are, that are uh, becoming commonplace in our world, and we would, we would look and go, the world's no longer thumbing its nose at God, it's, it's slapping God in the face. Of the, the evil and wickedness that is being made, made justified by our laws and not justified before, before the Lord, which he's the righteous judge and the ultimate judge. Uh, the world is full of selfishness and pridefulness and arrogance. And we need to be careful that we don't allow those, those evil attributes to become evident in our life. Pride is a real problem. Now, pride is a problem for, for any class of person. Pride is a problem for children. We see it. We've got a day school here. Some of you have young children at home or you have grandchildren, and you would understand pride is a problem. I know you think they're angelic, and we kind of excuse their pride, but pride's a problem. We deal with pride among our, our uh, kindergarten students here. You know something else? I'm not being ugly. A pride's a problem with senior saints, too. I'm here to tell you, I've tried to help some people along the way sometimes, and you're going, my soul, I'm here to help you. But boy, pride, pride gets in the way there, and they, you know, they refuse help that they, they know they need. Why? It's pride. My point is not to uh, degrade the youngster or the elder, but to say pride's a problem for everybody. Everybody, we all deal with pride. Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17, the Bible lists pride among the things the Lord hates. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. The first one is a proud look. Pride's a problem. Proverbs 11 and verse 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly, with the humble, is wisdom. Proverbs 3, 34, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. James 4 and verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. If you want to live in the grace of God, humble yourself before the Lord. Recognize that every day is a gift from God. Recognize that every dollar is a gift from God. Recognize that any good in your life could only be by the mercy and grace of the Lord. God gives us ability. God gives us the opportunity to develop our talents and, and our intelligence, our intellectual capacities, our skills, and we should. But all of these are gifts from the Lord. 
Pride is a problem. Yet we're grateful that mercy and grace are provided. Aren't you thankful that that, that, that is true of God? Aren't you thankful that the first time you make a mistake, God doesn't say, well, that's it, done with you, on to the next. That's right. We'd all be in a mess. I mean, let's just be honest. We'd be in a mess today. Right? We need God's mercy and grace every day. God is in large part carrying his judgment in our day, isn't he? Why? Because of his mercy and his grace, his loving compassion. He desires that sinful men, sinful women, sinful boys, and sinful girls would turn to him in repentance and faith and receive him. So while pride is a great problem, we all deal with pride, mercy and grace are provided. You know, pride is the leading, I think, the leading problem with people coming to faith in Christ. That's why it's easier for a young person to trust the Lord than it is an older person. Because although a young person is, is dealing with pride, it's not hard to convince a youngster that they're a sinner. But the older we get, the more we want to hold on to our pride, reject, reject our sinfulness, and we have, this, we have this problem. We compare ourselves among ourselves. The Bible says that's unwise. But we need God's mercy and grace, and God's mercy and grace are provided. God is tearing his judgment, and we can be thankful for that, but God's delay in judgment today should never be confused with his endorsement of our rejection or resistance of his word, his will, or his way. Are you listening? We have this idea that, that well, I committed this sin and God didn't strike me dead, so I guess it's okay. That is not the case. It was a full year after Daniel had interpreted this dream to Nebuchadnezzar that the judgment fell. Do you think it took a year for Nebuchadnezzar to have a prideful thought? Be honest with me here. I'm, I mean, it's not in the not in the Bible, but it's not stated here. But based on Nebuchadnezzar's character that we know, how long do you think after Daniel interpreted this dream to Nebuchadnezzar did he have a prideful thought? Uh, one oh, here you go. I like that. Right. I was going to say a few minutes or ten minutes, but you know, one second's probably a little more accurate. Right? God tarried His judgment because of God's mercy and grace. God carries his judgment with you and I. We should never, ever confuse God carrying his judgment in our life with his endorsement of our prideful sinfulness. Ecclesiastes 8 and 11, the Bible says this, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Well, the sentence wasn't passed speedily. God didn't judge me immediately, so I'll just keep going this way. Oh, don't be foolish, friend. You can be grateful that God is gracious and merciful with you. God is long-suffering. He is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, let's not confuse God's delay in, in judgment with him endorsing our sinfulness. So judgment now. You can make that choice. What, what do I mean by that? I mean, we can view our sin as God does. So we can judge ourselves the way the Lord judges us, otherwise known as confession. You follow me? And we can enjoy the forgiveness of God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Judgment now is, that's your choice. Say, no, wait a minute, that's up to God. No, God's already judged. 